Well, some of you may remember a phrase. It went like this, security trumps trade. It was the words of the American ambassador to Canada at the time of 9-11. And it's an issue we've been wrestling with across border with our largest neighbor for many, many years. Issue flared up again recently. You've for the phrase Roxham Road, and it was under discussion when the President of the United States uh, visited Canada recently. So we thought we'd go back uh, to the source on this one. Uh, John Manley, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Industry, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, Head of the Business Council of Canada. I could go on and on and on, but at the time he was dealing with this these cross-border issues, uh, as was I. I was in New York. Our paths crossed a lot uh, crossed a lot at that time. So just want to welcome John Manley. Um, uh, I will call you a long time and old friend because we even went to Afghanistan together and that uh, that creates a bond for sure. Yeah, I'd prefer long time to old, but that's yes, okay. okay. We'll go with long time. We'll go with long time. How are you? Good. I'm good. I'm I'm uh, ha happy to be still, you know, busy and doing things and involved in public policy. So right, it it is. It's important to keep yourself going. So as I said, when we first decided to call you, this was all about Roxham Road and and the safe third country. But I, and and I want to get to that and spend a little time. But let me just ask about some other things that are out there. This week we saw a report in the U.S. on Afghanistan and about the horrific and very, very flawed and fatal withdrawal of U.S. forces out of that country. Um, and, and I don't know whether you still get the emails, I certainly do, from people who worked with our troops in Afghanistan saying, we're still here, we're trapped, help us, please help us. What are your thoughts on, on where we are today? Oh, it's it's tragic. Um, there's no doubt about that. I think that where things took a bad turn uh, in the whole um, Western approach to Afghanistan was in March 2003 when the United States decided to invade Iraq uh, because it shifted their attention, their focus entirely away from Afghanistan. We never had things like suicide bombings or IEDs in Afghanistan prior to the Iraq war beginning. Those were uh, tactics that were uh, that, that crossed into Afghanistan after the after the war in Iraq had been had been started. And I've often wondered uh, how things might have been different if instead of trying to establish a some kind of uh, Western style democracy in Afghanistan, if, uh, if, if NATO and our other allied forces had focused on supplying basic human necessities, yeah. food, um, medical supplies, education. We did do a, a lot of education for, for girls and young women, um, but by trying to create, you know, a democratic government, it was, uh, it was was probably more than we could manage to do. And it, it uh, distracted us, I think, from really making progress on some of the human needs. We had that conversation as a group, uh, the five of us that went to Afghanistan, but also as individuals there. And I remember talking to a, a group of women parliamentarians, Afghan women, and you know, talking about all these democratic structures that we have in the West, and if they would just adopt them, you know, how wonderful life would be. And and their response was, you know, that's great, that's the goal. We'd love to get there, but right now we're trying to keep our children alive and fed. And yeah. sometimes we just lose sight of that when we come in to help when the West rides in on its uh, on its white horse. No, no, I mean, I, I think that I was there as the, there was a the early transition in Afghanistan policy. I mean, we didn't go into Afghanistan after 9-11 with the intention of overthrowing the Taliban. Right. We, we went in with the intention of disabling Al Qaeda as a force for terrorism. And uh, Canadians were there right from the very beginning with special yeah. forces. 
uh, with uh, the Canadian Air Force. Um, and we were part of that whole effort. And I remember very distinctly being in New York for the UN General Assembly in 2001. It was delayed, normally it's in September, it was delayed to November because of the 9-11 events. And the G8 foreign ministers were meeting in a, in a session which, is, which happens every year in a restaurant in New York, private room. While we were having dinner, the reports were coming in of the Taliban fleeing out of Kabul. And so we, we suddenly had, instead of having, you know, a country that was ill-governed, uh, had a failed state in South Asia. And I think the initial response, which was, how do we reestablish order out of chaos? How do we begin to build some, some structures uh, of governance in this country? Those were the right instincts. Mm -hmm. uh, but we somehow skipped forward to, well, if it's going to have a government, it's going to kind of look like ours and there'll be a federal state and we'll have elections and, you know, every will be, everybody will be empowered to vote and, and, uh, you know, instead, we uh, we didn't immerse ourselves in the very uh, deep uh, traditions in Afghanistan in which, you know, tribes are very disparate and villagers are very independent. And uh, uh, we could have learned some things from from previous experience in doing that. But be that as it may, we fought a yeah. good fight. We were there a long time. I think Prime Minister Harper decided 10 years was enough. Clearly, President Obama decided 21 years was enough. Um, the heartbreaking thing, as you say, is that uh, we, you know, the, the extrication of U.S. forces preceded extricating people yeah. whose past support um, and allegiance made them vulnerable and their families. And uh, that, I think, is uh, is tragic. Yeah, it's a huge. Well, and the issues are still there. I mean, they still there are many people and we're told Canadians, too, uh, still trapped in that country. NATO, I think, has been making it clear and, and might formalize it uh, shortly, which is they want 2% spending on defense to become the floor, not the ceiling for NATO uh, countries, and we have never made it yet. Should we, and will we? Well, I think we, uh, the, the need for increased defense spending is, is I think, obvious to everyone now. Uh, if you didn't need a better reason for it, you just need to look at our northern border exactly. and realize that, that our northern neighbor is volatile, uh, and uh, territorial and dangerous and nuclear powered. And um, if you look at the Chinese Belt and Road uh, initiatives, they include the Arctic as part of their Absolutely. Uh, purview. Yeah. And we, you know, we don't know what's going on uh, in waters that we claim. Uh, so, you know, I suspect Pamela, we, we could get close to the 2% if we just fully uh, occupied our territory that we've been claiming for 130 years in the Arctic. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 you know, our U.S. border is not the largest undefended border in the world. Our Arctic is the largest undefended border in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to get serious about, about that. I think on, the, on, you know, on the broader question of, of, you know, NATO and what our NATO counterparts are doing. Look, we, we all took, we all took a, we called it a peace dividend when the Soviet Union fell. And uh, that was understandable. Uh, yeah. the, the, the immediacy of threat was diminished. Germany, you know, Germany was the center, Berlin particularly, was the center point of the Cold War. 
And we, we knew that if Russian troops walked 100 meters from the Brandenburg Gate, it was a war. I mean, there's no ambiguity about it. Well, and, you know, by, by the 1990s, Germany was united. Uh, Poland was free and independent. Other East European states followed Czechoslovakia, Hungary, um, and uh, and we had agreements to dismantle and destroy nuclear weapons. Ukraine, a new state, gave up its nuclear arsenal as part of that. So I think it was totally understandable that we would all say, we've got better things to spend money on than guns and tanks. But the trouble is that uh, we're facing a world that uh, has its that is in some ways echoing what we observed in the 1930s when a vanquished Germany rearmed and rebuilt uh, when a despotic leader convinced his people that there was some destiny that Germany was being denied uh, and that they needed to reestablish their their uh, imperial empire and unite the German speaking peoples to give them living room, Lebensraum. I think we're seeing that play out. Yeah. Uh, only this time it's the Russian empire and it's, a, and, it's a, and it's a different leader who is appealing to very base instincts and that quite honestly, we in democracies, have, we don't compute things that way. Exactly. We don't even hear what they're saying. Or I mean, I guess this is, has been my concern in this conflict too, which is there were there were clear and direct moves in Crimea, and 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 we just kind of went, oh well, that's that's not really going to happen. We you shouldn't do that, or or we we're going to get really mad. But we didn't really do anything, and so I think he took that to be a sign that we weren't going to uh, respond in in any uh, very serious way. So here he is in Ukraine. I think he's, uh, I think he's very surprised by the, the response. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, we, 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 this is an echo of the 1930s and, and um, a, a Britain and it's, allies stood back and watched uh, the Germans march into Austria and then into Czechoslovakia. They didn't lift a finger despite pleas. Um, and it was only, only uh, when they invaded Poland that they responded. And at that point, there were many in Britain and America saying, who cares about Poland? Like, that's mm -hmm. not our, that's not in our backyard. Um, and by the way, that went on in the United States well into the years of the of the of the London Blitz. So we've seen this play out uh, in Chechnya, in Georgia, then, as you say, in Crimea, uh, with you know tisk tisking on the part of the West. But really, who wanted to confront a you know a power a nuclear power over? territory that is of very little interest to Western democracies. I think that that was our attitude, but it gave Vladimir Putin false confidence that that we wouldn't stand up for anything. And I think he's he's taken aback by this. The, the worry that I have, and I and I'm I mean real worry. Like I worry about this on a daily basis. I Pamela, I've got seven grandchildren now. Yeah. I, 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 I I want them to be around a long time. I, I worry that that uh, he hasn't left himself an exit ramp mm -hmm. from this, and uh, I also worry that um, you know, the patience of Western democracies may flag in this, and support yeah. for Ukraine Short uh, will will we're we're already seeing it among some of the Republicans. Uh, that may seek the presidency, you know, is how is this in our interests? Um, 
and uh, I think that that uh, Putin is playing for time, and he's hoping that the you know Western commitment weakens. Yeah. He's hoping that we will accept a, a negotiation which will leave him in a better position than he was before this war started, but with no assurance that he won't, you know, uh, resume at, at a time when he has rearmed and retrained and overcome some of the mistakes that went into this. So I think we're at a very crucial time. Yeah. And he the is last thing I want power. is a replay of the Munich agreement. Yeah. So lots to worry about there when you unpack it. What's Canada's role? You know, Canada uh, Canada is a, is a bit of a price taker in this. We, you know, we're responding to the requests that are being made to the best of our ability. I was a little surprised that the budget didn't recognize that these the demands on our military are increasing. Truthfully, you can't you can't just up the budget because I've, I've been I was don't forget I was never Minister of Defense I was Minister of Finance, um, and the, and the Defense Department isn't always able to spend all the money you might want to throw at. It. So uh, you know we we don't want to waste money, but I think yeah. we should have set a clear path toward increasing uh, our capabilities, both in the North and in fulfilling our obligations in NATO and in, in our you know, own um, you know, safety and security internally in, in, in Canada. All of these could use you know, more and better equipment, more mm. troops, more training, more, more skills development. And we do have some of that coming on the, you know, the F-35s are ordered years before they're flying in the skies. Yeah. Uh, that's all good. But I think we've got a, a shorter term, medium term issue that that I feel that we need to address. And oh, by the way, if there, I've been through this too. If any Canadian wants to be Secretary General of NATO, <laughs> um, we're going to have to get to the 2%. It's, it's, it's yeah. not, not, not going to happen otherwise. The running. No, I, you know, some will remember too, you were very, uh, you once very famously said that Canada, you know, sits at the dinner table or all these international tables and then just gets up and leaves the table and goes to the washroom when the bill's about to arrive. And it seems like not a lot has changed on that since you uttered that phrase. Well, you know, Canadians don't like to spend on that stuff. Yeah. They don't like it. It's not politically popular. And therefore, it would require a real effort of leadership. I mean, you, people will rally to support things that in their initial response, they say they don't support. That's where leadership comes in. That's where convincing and, and telling people, this is why we're doing this. This is why we've got to do it. This is why you should support it. You can win that argument, but but if you just do what people tell you in an, in a in a pollster's questions, you're you're not going to spend money on defense or foreign aid or any of those things. It's just not that popular off uh, offhand for people. Well, and when we're in the middle of the kind of inflationary crunch we are, although uh, you know it seems to be holding, but certainly not on the food front or or the the fuel front let let's go um back because it's it's all connected to this whole issue of where we started you talked about our vulnerability on the northern border uh lots of focus however on our border with the US just take us back and um remind everybody of the context in which we were very much asking for a safe third country agreement and uh and and stronger cooperation at the border this is all kind of in the wake of 9 11. well the context post 9 11 was that we um we we were very concerned that point of weakness for U.S. security. Uh, there, there were there was a widespread belief 
that some of the 9-11 terrorists had entered Canada, entered the United States from Canada. Um, that originated on 9-11 itself because the, uh, some of them did initiate their journey in, in Portland, Maine. Yeah. And somebody put two and two together and came up with five and said, well, they must have come in from Canada into Maine. They didn't. And it Hillary Clinton said it too, which didn't help. It, Hillary Clinton said it and Newt Gingrich said it. So it was one of those things on which those two agreed, even though there <laughs> was much else on which they agreed. I know the Prime Minister Kretschmann sent me to Washington to meet with Senator Clinton uh, just to try to uh, tone her down a little bit on this. And it was a very bizarre meeting where I said, well, you know, I've talked to our security and intelligence people. I've talked to the police. I've talked to everybody we've got that, have, you know, have been studying this. Yep. And, and you must have some intelligence that we don't have. Right. Could you please enlighten me on this? <laughs> because as far as we know, they these people were never in Canada. Right. And she looked completely shocked and said, well, well, maybe they weren't, but, you know, security trumps trade, just what Ambassador yep. Gallucci had said. Um, and uh, went out into the corridor outside of the Senate office building where there was a gaggle of mainly Canadian <laughs> reporters, reporters right? and asked her about this. And she said, well, no, I don't know that they came from Canada, but I do know that that uh, northern border security is a very important issue. So she 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 didn't exactly apologize or back off, right. but she, she further emphasized. So we 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 um, approached this we the Canadian government as an opportunity. Um, when President Bush named the governor of Pennsylvania Tom Ridge as White House advisor on Homeland Security. Um, Prime Minister Kretschmann, I was the foreign minister at the time, he asked me to uh, be the counterpart to this new officer. We didn't have anybody that was exactly equivalent. Certainly nobody in the prime minister's office had that kind of role. So uh, I phoned him. I, he still to this day says, you're the first international call I received. He was in, <laughs> still in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I was there at the White House within a week with a delegation, including the commissioner of the RCMP in his full red uniform. He did not bring a house, a horse with him, but he was otherwise <laughs> in full regalia. Uh, we made quite an impression. They, the US needed an agenda. We gave them an agenda. We gave them a 22 point plan. Uh, we called it the Smart Border Accord. Uh, we signed it in Ottawa on December 11th. So you know, exactly three months to the day after 9-11. Um, and one of the items in it was uh, that we, we would uh, enter into a safe third agreement. Now, why was this important? It's, it, it, it wasn't Roxham Road at the time. It was uh, formal border crossing points, especially coming in at Fort Erie and Niagara Falls, a couple of others. Um, yeah, John, this and, is like, this is a really important distinction because yeah. we weren't dealing with, you know, all of the news that you hear from the American Southern right. border with illegals flowing over or the same thing at the Roxham Road. This was about people who wanted to apply for asylum or refugee status, having to do it in the country that they were in not the one they were trying to get to. Like, it, it seems, it's hard to imagine the context even. Well, that's that's what we were seeking to obtain from the United States. But these people were congregating in, many of them in church basements in Buffalo, New York, coming by bus to a Canadian border crossing, disembarking from the bus and immediately claiming refugee status. Um, so by the bus load, yeah, and uh, it's very similar to what had begun to happen as a result of some of these informal boarding crossing border crossings like Rocks and Road because people come in, we have to process them. They are entitled to a hearing. 
uh, it was taking a couple of years to have an adjudication done on whether or not they qualified for refugee status. We had to house them. We had to give them uh, welfare, social assistance. Healthcare. And it was, it was a huge burden for municipalities, for provinces, <clears throat> as well as for the federal government. In many cases, they... Uh, by the time their adjudication process was done, they had had multiple Canadian children born to them, mm -hmm. which which made it further complicated. So we uh, we basically asked uh, the United States to agree that um, when uh, a an asylum claimant landed, be it in Canada or in the United States they'd be obliged to make the claim for asylum in that country. And uh, it was it, it was a hard thing for Tom Ridge to give to me. Uh, his Department of Justice uh, didn't want to agree to that. Uh, they, uh, they were happy to see these people leave the United States. They didn't have to deal with them. Um, whether they were real refugees or not, uh, they were somebody else's problem when they crossed the border. Uh, so we negotiated the agreement. We did give them some things. Uh, harmonization of visa requirements was one of the things I believe that we we negotiated as as a quid pro quo, and it worked pretty well until sometime in the last few years, people started deciding that they would cross at informal or you know land border crossings. Roxham Road being one. There are places in in Manitoba, they were crossing, there are river crossings, there's, there's lots of these things. And so therefore the recent discussion about, uh, you know, making changes to the smart border report. But the point I'd make, Pamela, is that this should not be seen first and foremost about refugee uh, policy, immigration and refugee status, asylum seekers. This should be seen first and foremost as, can the country control its borders? Right, exactly. There, there is, in my mind, there is absolutely no question that we, as Canada, we have an obligation to provide shelter for some of the world's refugees. You know, according to the UN uh, Refugee Agency, there's one and a half billion human beings that are displaced by force on the right. planet today. Yeah. Well, that's a, that is a huge problem. If we want to take a thousand refugees, 20,000 refugees, a million refugees, we have no trouble finding them. And Canada, I think you, you have to say whether it's most recently uh, prior to that from uh, from Syria, from various African countries. Canada has been, you know, very generous, and we've had very successful in having community groups sponsor refugees, provide them with housing, see that they get their feet on the ground in new communities, uh, build them a network. But when people just wander in across the border, undocumented, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they yeah. come from. We don't know who made money getting them to the border, by the way, probably, you know, the, the human smuggling and profiteering that was incented by the fact that our border was porous. These, these, this, that's a different matter from dealing with, you know, real asylum seekers. And it yeah. always seems to me that if you're fleeing the United States, well, you know, really, uh, yeah. there are really, you know, I, I love Canada and I'm, you know, but, you know, there are way worse countries in the world than the United States from which. Yeah, we well, shouldn't. I think that's part of the problem. We're having a little bit of trouble with your sound here. So I just want to make sure that that people get the points that you are making, because I think it was, I think you, you really touched on a lot of things. I mean, as, as you just noted, there are huge numbers of, of people, migrants who are on the move around the world. We as an independent country uh, need to establish what we want to do about that. 
But we first and foremost have to make a distinction between those seeking asylum and those who are engaged in illegal activity and are using a relatively porous border to come and go as they please. The definition of a country is its ability to mark and defend its borders. Um, and so are we are we any closer to that with the discussions that Mr. Biden and Mr. Trudeau had on any of this? Um, have we have we focused in on the right problem or isn't that up to our respective domestic governments to say we're going to enforce our borders? Well, I think we, I, I, you know, there is, there is truth in saying that you plug one hole, another one will open. So I right. think the fact that we've been able uh, to expand the safe third agreement to include um people coming in at Broxham Road or in Manitoba or other places. Yeah. I think that that's, that is, that's a big improvement. And it does enable us then to return these people to the United States. Yeah, and, which and is so, not really a country. And I think that was your point. You're, they're not fleeing uh, yeah. a death and destruction in the United States. This is not some, you know, um, dangerous, thug run country where their people are fleeing for their lives. Well, there's lots of reasons people are refugees, but most yep. of them don't apply in the United States. Right. Now they they may be fleeing because they think they are not going to be approved as refugees in the United right. States. They have their own system and their own process. Yeah. And I don't think we want to get into being the court of appeal for the US refugee right. determination system. As I say, there's a lot of people to choose from out there in the world if we want to be generous to refugees and we should set about doing that but we've yeah. got to control our own borders no i think that's that's the the crucial point and we do have to be sure that we're sending that message too that this is not just i think people reacted at the beginning with the rcmp being sent out to help illegal people bring their suitcases across the border you know i mean that was a that's not an image. I mean, as generous as Canadians think they are, we don't want to be bringing in elements that are um, potentially criminal. Well, potentially criminal. We're also giving people false hopes um, yeah. because they still have to establish that they are genuine refugees. Right. And, uh, you know, many of them may not be. And many of them, as I said earlier, may have paid a princely sum exactly. to to profiteers to get them to our apologies we've been having some technical problems throughout all of this the uh, the content's great the connection's lousy so we're just going to carry on a little bit there's a few other things i'd just like to get your your thoughts on um particularly in the wake of the the biden visit and the focus now has switch to look what the Americans are doing and how they're um, making Buy America uh, acceptable and something that Canadians should be emulating to build up our own um, domestic industries, which we saw we had some issues with, uh, obviously, during COVID and, and other things. Do you think they're uh, dealing with the current economic situation in a in a smarter way than we are, or they just can because of the size of their economy? Well, I think it's more of a latter, Pamela. I think that they they are taking advantage of being uh, such a huge market um, and uh, they will get, you know, it'll be suboptimal in the sense that their prices and costs will be higher, but uh, Buy America has been good politics for both parties for yep. a long time. so. That won't change, and I, I think we we need to be very clever about how we work around that. But they're incentivizing in a different way the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It's all about rewarding people for good behavior. Where the part of the problem with the carbon tax is it's punitive. I mean, you even hear the environment minister say, you know, the carbon tax will work when it really starts to 
squeeze, when people really start to hurt, it's a different approach to changing behavior. And I'm wondering if theirs wouldn't work better in Western societies where we don't want to give up our heating and our air conditioning and some of the uh, essentials of life. Yeah, I, I would divide those two questions a little bit. I mean, how, how we uh, deal with uh, carbon emissions and and incent behavior that reduces our carbon footprint is is one thing, but how we support uh, an, a, a an economy uh, in what is a what I call a deglobalizing environment is is different, and and I think that. Uh, we've been very successful since the Canada US free trade agreement um, in building market share in the United States yeah. based on things that we can do and can do well. And to the extent that we get locked out of their market, um, I think that becomes a serious, a serious problem for us. What they're calling an Inflation Reduction Act is of course nothing of the sort. Because it has nothing to do with inflation. Nope. And in fact, it's if about anything, spending. <laughs> it's about spending, which probably yeah. increases inflation when you when you right. get right down to it. So uh, I don't think we want to emulate that, but I do. Uh, my, I I think that you know the era when we didn't talk about industrial policy uh, is over, and and I was certainly been part of that era. I believed. Uh, you know, when, when I had the industry portfolio, we were in the early stages of globalization. And, and I thought we, you know, we had pretty much uh, unfettered access between NAFTA and the uh, agreement of the WTO to much of the world's markets. And what we needed was uh, policies that weren't directive to business, uh, that didn't pick uh, winners and losers. By the way, Government's problem there is always uh, not that they are bad at picking winners, but they are never very good at shaking the losers. <laughs> um, once you've got them, you're, they're yours. They're and, living in the basement forever. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, I, you know, I think that that uh, the, the real the moment when I felt like this, this things have really changed here was the day that Donald Trump decided that he was going to prevent the export of PPE to Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the raw materials for the PPE had largely gone into the United States from Canada. Correct. <laughs> and plus most countries were mainly buying their stuff from China anyway. Right. But it was a signal that if we ever thought we were part of the big American family, no, no, we were you know distant cousins at best. Yeah. And that therefore, we should probably be very uh, carefully thinking through what are the things that, that we need to be able to do domestically. It may cost us more than it would have to have our own, well, I say with that example, our own PPE manufacturing yeah. capability. It may cost us more than it would if we could import all our stuff to have, you know, the capability of, of doing some other things. We need to figure out what those things are that we really want a domestic uh, capacity for and uh, find ways to either incent their development or support their development um, uh, and uh, live with the consequences, I'm sorry to say. I, I don't think it's the best way to run economic policy, but I think we're, we're being left with few choices uh, given what I call a deglobalization trend. Well, and I mean, both Democrats and Republicans, when the going gets tough, I mean, we are we we aren't distant cousins at that point. We've seen right. protectionist, you know, policies all around. So but we are a relatively small economy. We have paid for many of our social services and our benefits through the energy sector. That's now uh struggling i mean parts of it doing well but once your government declares your you know your kind of um you're over uh it's hard to see investment pouring into this country in a very constructive way in the short term we're seeing governments throw a lot of money at one off projects and this and that but that is not a strategy 
Yeah, and they and also hope is not a strategy. So right, right. Um, and, I, and I think that there, the issue here is to put it on a, in a different plane is how do we create wealth in Canada um, at this point in time? Uh, we're we're clearly really good at, at redistributing it, <laughs> but you know you can only redistribute what you create. Yep. And that means you've got to encourage investment. You've got to you've got to acknowledge what your uh, comparative strengths are, um, and uh, you've got to you've got to build on those. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, for many, uh, there's no doubt that the world is moving toward a, a, a global economy with less carbon. Oh uh, yeah, we need to get yeah. there for. For climate reasons, we need to get there. For pollution reasons, no doubt about it. But it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and uh, we, we need to figure out how we responsibly, responsibly play uh, to that interim period where there's got to be a pathway to decarbonization. And how do we, how do we encourage that? How do we manage th through it? As you say, we have some vital industries uh, in the extraction sector that will contribute to wealth creation. And uh, we, need, we need to sustain them because they are needed on the planet still, whether, whether we like it or not. Nuclear fusion development, big news, but it's yeah. decades yeah. from commercialization. Uh, we maybe turned a quarter um, in the past year, uh, which would be uh, which would be, you know, uh, something we could all hope for. Uh, we've obviously improved the ability uh, to produce electricity through other means. The efficiency of solar power uh, being the key example of that. Uh, but that's not going to give us base power. Yeah. Uh, for electricity, it's it, it it you know in terms of transportation. We've got a long way to go on hydrogen. Um, we have some basic problems with, uh, I think, with too much reliance on electric vehicles uh, yeah. because of the importance of some of the minerals that need to be extracted yeah. in order to build batteries with current, with the current uh, um, technology. But, that exists. but this is this is kind of part of what I what I'm just trying to get at, and it's almost like for a whole other discussion, but. We're sending all these signals that we're we're doing the switch, you know, immediately. And and I think in the real world, people know that's not realistic in terms of the timeline that has been laid out. And so they're a bit reluctant to invest in this country until we sound a bit more realistic. Well, I think that's part of it. Part of it is also that we have been so uh, uh, incapable of getting major projects uh, completed yeah. in a timely fashion. In fact, not just major, but major and minor projects completed in a timely fashion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and that, that has weighed on us quite heavily. Um, you know, the development of resources uh, is conditional on the ability to deliver them to markets. Yeah. And uh, we we can't we can't forget that. That, uh, yeah. that those two uh, parts come together. And for Canadians, it's a lot of jobs. And by the way, uh, for Indigenous Canadians, it's a lot of jobs. Exactly, yeah, for sure. John, just just great to catch up and connect and hear your thoughts on this. I think we'll come back and do a whole other thing on on what we're doing economically speaking, but I, I just couldn't resist. I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that, you don't agree we should be putting education or home improvements on our credit card either, which has been doing the rounds on the internet this week. So, but it, it's just great to have your clear thinking on this and good to see you. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Pamela. Yeah, it's great. great. To see you. John Manley uh, served this country in many, many ways. Lawyer, businessman, politician, minister of industry, foreign affairs, deputy prime minister, finance minister, and really was uh, a very powerful voice. And I say this from personal experience in the uh, in the wake of 9-11. He was a friend to 
America when they needed a friend. And um, it really helped, I think, get our country through a very, very tough time. So just going to say thank you for that, John. It was yeah. always an honor to serve. I, I know you believe that. I, you, I, I know you really believe it, and that's a great thing. John Manley, and that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll talk soon.